first of all, let me say a big thank you for the invitation to come here. Um, I haven't been to Adelaide for 25 years, and it's a very nice uh, opportunity to come back. It's such a civilized place, as they say. Wonderful cafes and bars, and you know, going down the little lanes opposite the hotel this morning was very pleasant. Had a wonderful French breakfast with an enormous coffee cup, and I, I do enjoy this very much. I think it's greatly superior to Melbourne, which is where I've recently been, a much, over, a much overrated city, in my opinion. <laughs> anyway, Melbourne's so proud of itself, it's disgusting. But uh, I, I, do, I do enjoy the lesser glories of, of, of Adelaide, and very happy to be here. And, um, and this morning's talks were so interesting, I, I must say. I think it's wonderful to be so open-ended and to let people just sort of you know, ramble on about whatever happens to be on their minds. Um, and um, please keep me under control because I'm rather a rambler, you know. <laughs> I was talking in Singapore three days ago and I said, you know, my method is Xiao Yao Yao, which is the great Chinese philosopher Zhuangzi. That's the only way to do it, is to ramble, you know. So I do tend to ramble. However, I've tried to be um, a bit more controlled by preparing for this talk. And in order to do that, I consulted the I Ching, which of course is the, great, the greatest book of all. And um, I thought it was relevant because I couldn't really understand what this workshop was all about. I just saw words like world literature and, you know, Antipodean China. It was so wonderful. I had no idea what was going on. So I thought, well, the I Ching really is truly a world book, you know. It's, it's the, perhaps the most universal, um, not only the most universal Chinese book, but perhaps the most universal book of any kind in any language, you know, and it happens to be about 2,500 years old. And of course, it's been the number one classic of Chinese culture ever since. And it's a wonderful book because no one has the faintest idea what it means. And so over, through the generations, people have just been, it's just kind of empty space at the heart of Chinese culture. So people have put in there whatever they felt like putting in from one generation, one dynasty to the next. Um, anyone who says they really know what that book means is lying, and I, you know, I'm prepared to challenge them on that basis. Anyway, it's, however, although it's a very, very hard book to understand, it is an extraordinarily powerful book, and it never lets me down. It always provides me with the most amazing um, responses. So I consulted it yesterday about the subject of you know, China, becoming a world, Chinese literature becoming a world literature. That was about the most sense I could make of this workshop. And, and what were the problems involved and what can we do about it? And this dear old book always comes up with the goods, provided you do your homework beforehand, which simply means formulating your question. And it came up immediately with the sixth hexagram, which is the word sung, which means conflict. And the other thing the book does is it, it requires of you that you spend some time thinking about what it says. And of course, the word, the word conflict is, is an English word. The Chinese word sung is a more complex word than conflict. And the structure of the hexagram, and the book is organized according to 64 of these strange structures, but the structure of this one has got the sky above, and then it's got water underneath. And the whole point is that the sky has a tendency to rise up, water has a tendency to descend. So the two are in conflict, and they create conflict. And it's an unresolved conflict. I mean, the whole hexagram is terribly negative. It's describing a very difficult time. And it, and it, it sort of analyzes that conflict in terms of the lack of what it calls resonance. Resonance is, a, is the most important single word in the I Ching. And when, when a monk was asked in the fourth century, what is the I Ching all about? He just said the one word resonance. It's about resonance. Resonance, the Chinese word is gan ying. It means the way people resonate with each other, the way the way minds resonate with each other. And of course, in the context of this workshop, it means the way in which literatures and cultures resonate with each other. And we've had some wonderful examples of that this morning, listening to um, some of the talks. I mean, I was really bowled over by some of them because we, we, we see evidence of this kind of resonance, you know, on many levels. And, um, but but what, what the I Ching is saying is that we live in a time where that resonance is extremely difficult because the current, the current situation is 
a violation of the harmony of the Tao. That's what it says. And in order to, in order to surmount this difficulty, we have, it's very, 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 very explicit. We have to return to the root. We have to gue, which is another key word in the, in the Egypt. Gue means to return to where you really belong. And it means, in fact, it's, it's described as the cry of the hermit. Okay. And in order, for, for, in order for us to progress to a situation where resonance is possible, all we can do is to retreat, is to return to, um, to, the, um, to the root of what we really are. And then, as, as happens in the Yi Jing, because there are three changing lines, the hexagram turns into another one, which is hexagram number 31. And hexagram number 31, of course, is in fact the hexagram of resonance. So the two things, that's why I say this book never fails. It, the whole of hexagram 31 is about resonance and how to achieve resonance and um, how to enable energies to resonate with each other, to connect. Pung, that's another key word in the aging connection, you know. As Ian Forster so famously said, only connect, you know. And of course, that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, I speak as a translator. I have, no, I have no knowledge of theory. I have no knowledge of anything, really, but I do work away as a translator. It's a humble profession. And as I mentioned this morning, it's a great honor to be here with people who actually are creative writers because, you know, to a certain extent, translators are failed. They're creative writers, monke, you know, who've not been able to actually create, but instead have to piggyback on, you know, on the backs of creative writers. It's a great honor to be here with writers who, whose work I admire. Um, now, so I'm going to try not to ramble too much, Nick, don't worry. I'm sort of getting to the point. Now, the thing is, this, this situation has not always been this way. There have been times when there has been extraordinary resonance. And I'm going to give you one example from the late 19th century, um, when, when, of course, China was in the throes of disintegration under the Manchu dynasty. But... Um, there lived in London a very remarkable gentleman, one of my personal favorite authors by the name of Oscar Wilde. And um, in the late 80s, um, a very fine translator called Herbert Giles produced a complete translation of the Chinese Taoist classic Zhuangzi, which was published in Shanghai and London simultaneously. You see, there was a whole load of, re of resonance going on in those days between China and the West, peculiarly. Um, far more than there is now. And so Oscar Wilde read this book, um, the, the, the complete works of Zhuangzi, as translated by Herbert Giles, and he was absolutely knocked out by it. He wrote a very long review, and, it came, and he described it as the most significant book he'd read for years, and a very caustic analysis of modern society. So in other words, Oscar Wilde was resonating very, very strongly with, with this timeless Chinese philosophy of Taoism. And, um, and if, we, if we move slightly further into this century and look at it from a different perspective, from the perspective of a Chinese translator by the name of Fu Lei, a very great figure, uh, a tragic figure in the history of modern Chinese intellectual life, and a very great and, and indefatigable translator who, I mean, he translated Romain Roland's Jean-Christophe twice. I mean, to do it once is the sign of a madman. <laughs> to do it twice is, I think, beyond madness. And he did it, he felt he was so dissatisfied with his first translation that he had to do another one. I was in France last summer and I went into a bookshop and asked for a complete copy of Jean-Christophe and the bookseller looked at me and said, nobody reads that book anymore. He found me a copy, actually, but he said, nobody reads it. I said, well, they do in China, because that book is still read in China, and it was one of the most influential books of, of, of the 20th century in, in the Chinese intellectual contents. Incredible resonance there between the Chinese intellectuals and, and French, the great French idealist and Nobel Prize laureate, may I add, Romain Roland, and this unreadable novel, which I struggle to read. I mean, I've got about to page 15, I find it so heavy going, but it's a very important book, you know. And Foulet devoted a great deal of his life to these two versions of this novel. And um, when writing about this, when writing about his whole practice as a translator in, in that very long and extraordinary book called um, 
you know, um, uh, uh, Fu Lei Jiao Shu, the, the, the letters he wrote to his son, the pianist Fu Tong, he, he analyzes basically what it takes to be a good translator, a good communicator between cultures. In simple traditional Chinese terms, he says, you must have the heart of a child, chi zi zi xin, right? The heart of a child, and in order to have the heart of a child, you have to engage in endless xiu yang, in endless self-cultivation, in endless spiritual growth. This, of course, was in direct opposition to the thoughts of Mao Zedong, which were at that time running the country. You know, he, he, he quite explicitly opposed the Yan'an talks on literature. And for that, he paid a very high price, as we all know. He committed suicide in the first weeks of the Cultural Revolution. And, and, and that, to me, he, he was very much a protagonist of this kind of spiritual resonance. And the other example from the same book, from the, from the Jia Shu, from his letters to his son, he, he tries to explain why his son, was, Fu Tsung, was so good at playing the mazurkas of Chopin. And, um, you know, because he got the prize in Warsaw, special prize in the Chopin competition for his, for his mazurkas, not for anything else, but for his mazurkas. He came lower than first for the rest. But, um, and and Foulet writes the most wonderful paragraph, why did my son understand Chopin's mazurkas? Because I taught him to read Chinese poetry. Of course he understands Chopin's <laughs> mazurkas, you see? And this is the universal heart and mind, which is really the only thing I'm going to leave you with today, is, is my insistence that there is such a thing. And, and of course, the other wonderful statement from that book is, because he became a great connoisseur of Chinese painting, traditional Chinese landscape painting, and, and a very a successful collector, I may say. Um, but, you know, how did I come to understand the aesthetics of Chinese traditional painting? By visiting the Louvre and, and looking at the Impressionist masterpieces of the late 19th century. Again, a man with a universal um, vision of culture, literature, and art. And this is what we're so sadly lacking today, and what was, of course, destroyed um, in the case of Foulet and his wife, what was destroyed by, by the madness of the Cultural Revolution. So um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that in order to achieve this kind of um, Antipodean you know, vision, which I think is highly, highly commendable, we have to go back to this basic idea of cultivating the universal heart and mind, which is what translators have to do. We have no other choice. If we don't believe in that, we might as well give up straight away the whole job of translating because, you know, as I was saying uh, to some young graduate students in Singapore just two or three days ago, if it wasn't for the fact that we're actually human beings and that you're human beings as well as me, you're not dogs, you're human beings, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even conceive of the possibility of the task of translation. So I'm speaking as a translator here. But unfortunately, translation and literature in, in the Chinese context cannot avoid being, being um, tarnished, you know, with, with the political, um, uh, uh, whatever one wants to call it, malaise of, of, of this particular decade of, of the 21st century. Um, because unfortunately, um, not just literature, but translation, the whole enterprise, the whole literary enterprise has been very much, um, has, the gates have been closed more and more firmly in the last few years. And the other great work that I've been involved in all my life is that great wonderful novel, Hung Lo Meng, which is, which we call the story of the stone. And, um, it's an extraordinary thing to have worked on because my collaborator, David Hawkes, succeeded miraculously in in making this novel resonate in the Western world by being outrageously free in his translation. He took so many liberties. He broke all the rules. He put stuff in that wasn't there. He took stuff out that, you know, he, he was just um, determined to connect, determined to communicate, determined to make a novel that would, that would reach out from China to the world. And he succeeded too. And what I've discovered as, as I've been studying the translation more and more is that he succeeded because he was able to, um, to defy all the rules and to defy all the demands of, of the political agenda. For a start, he resigned from a university, absolutely important, because he was the chair professor of Chinese at Oxford, and he knew that his destiny was to translate the story of the stone, so he walked in one day and just resigned. And, you know, he didn't even think it out. Uh, two years later, he was absolutely bankrupt. He couldn't get a job. But he knew that he'd done the right thing. And, of course, he had. 
and, and um, he succeeded in this wonderful, it's one of the few real examples of, of success in this very difficult field of making Chinese literature communicate with the world. It doesn't matter whether it's Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, it doesn't matter. It's still, it's, it's the basic process that matters. And, um, you know, I was just briefed by my wonderful research assistant, Miss Ren, who will be talking to you in a minute, about the latest um, meeting of the, the Hong Lo Meng Xue Hui, the, the, the society in China that, that basically runs the study of the story of the stone. They just had their meeting in Shenzhen, and, and the, the most appalling and wonderfully funny um, address given by the chairman of the society on how now we must study the story of the stone according to Xi Jinping's thoughts, you see. And of course, Xi Jinping's a wonderful literary critic, as we all know, um, and, and his insights into this immortal classic would have to inform our studies from this day on, you know. And I mean, things are very, very bad. I mean, they haven't been this bad since, you know, for a very long time, anyway. The last time this happened was in the early 1950s, when Mao Zedong decided to use this novel for a political campaign. And he got hold of a couple of young people from Shandong, Li Xifan and Lan Ling, and launched a terrible persecution of China's intellectuals in the name of this novel. And, you know, th since then, this is, this is the first time I've seen anything like this in the public arena. And it's quite shocking, I must say. And really, it, it, it just puts, brings me back to the very beginning of this, this short talk, which is we are in, living in an era of conflict. And um, in this era, all we can do is to retreat and to return to the root, to take refuge. In fact, the words are very precise in the Yi Jing. Take refuge in a small town of 300 households, which is exactly what I'm doing next week. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe slightly more than 300 households, but not many. So I'm, t I, I'm going to retreat because with humility, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is a kind of, I'm not holding myself out as any kind of role model, but if we are living in a very, very, um, very difficult and conflicting times. And in order to achieve that wonderful goal of, of resonance of what, what the book calls, you know, true harmony with the Tao, there is no other option but to retreat. Thank you very much.